Crick. Crack. Monkey break your back on a rotten pomerac. But what is the mirage and what reality? Who knows what is truth and what is truly fiction? Crick. Crack. Aye, aye, aye. Monkey break your back on a rotten pomerac. When we were children, the signals were clear. Somebody say crick, we say. Crack. And we know then was storytelling time in the place. Somebody was going to take a high fall on something slippery, so we say. But look at that. Eh? Monkey mashing up your back on some rotten pomerac. But what is the mirage and what reality? Do you know what is truth and what is truly fiction? Crick. Mm, monkey mashing up your back on some rotten pomerac, but who knows what's the mirage and what's reality? Crick! Crack. My childhood was spent in Grenada, on the Caribbean island of Grenada. I remember when I enjoyed writing, when I enjoyed poetry, the poetry that I would be thinking about would be things like um, Hardy's I Lent Upon a Copper's Gate When Frost Was Specked to Grey and winter's dregs may desolate the weakening eye of day. I repeat that because um, while I enjoyed and still enjoy the movement of the words of the language, it meant that when I came to write, I was, in a sense, um, using Hardy's patterns, uh, trying to use that same kind of pattern. But of course, the informal education at the same time um, I was going home hearing stories told in a very different kind of voice and very different sorts of rhythms and there are very different kinds of content also. And while I enjoyed that, when I thought of literature, I didn't think of that. Now what I do now is really use my voice. In this competition, they're looking for poetry of worth for a writing that could wrap up a feeling and fling it back hard with a captive power to choke the stars. So they say, send them to us, but no dialects, please. We're British, eh? Huh. Well, I laugh till my bush at near drop. It's not only that I think about the dialect of the Normans and the Saxons that combine and reformulate to create a language elect. It's not only that I think how this British education must really be narrow if it leaves them with no knowledge of what their own history is about. It's not only that I think about the part of my story that come from Liverpool in a big ship mark, African slaves, please, we're the British. But as if that not enough pain for a body to bear, I think about the part on the plantations down there in the Caribbean, where they're so frightened of the power in the deep spaces behind our watching faces that they say, no African languages, please. It's against the law. Make me have to go and start up a language of my own that I could share with my people. Then when we start to shout about a language we own, a culture we own, a identity we own, them and the others, they leave the controller, say, stop that nonsense now. We're all British. I wonder when it changed to no dialects, please. We're British. To think how still some of them like that so frightened with power that they had to hide behind a language that we could wrap around with lick a finger in addition to we own. Heavens a mercy, that is danceness we. You know, sometimes some of them like that does make me really wonder where is all of the bright British. In my poetry, I use lots of different language registers because the Caribbean experience is an amalgamation, a synthesis of so many different experiences. You have in there whatever the language of the colonizing power was, um, along with the rhythms of the African languages, of the Asian languages. And because all of that was part of my own experience growing up, um, I use all of them in my writing. Back there where fishermen can't swim, where the Ice Age coast of Donegal leaves rocks among the waves, a lobster boat cast off, whose engine croaked before the rocks were by. The youngest in the crew leapt out onto a rock to push the boat away. 
then laughed when he couldn't jump back. But exactly when did he realize that the boat would float no nearer, that all those pulls on the engine cord would yield no shudders, that no rope or life belt existed to be thrown, that those flares were lost in cloud, that the radio would bring a copter an hour later. He had 40 minutes to cling while the waves attacked, to feel the rock gradually submerge. And they had 40 minutes of watching, shouting into the radio, till he cried out, sank from view, and stayed there. I think ideally a poem should work both on the page and at a reading. The poems that I tend to read aloud for my work almost always tend to be narrative ones, which means dramatic. So a poem like Where Fishermen Can't Swim is a good one to read because there is a drama unfolding as you're listening to it and you're sucked into it and it's quite clear so there's nobody not going to be aware of what's happening. I feel that the cadences that I use in the speech rhythms are completely part of my accent and the way I speak, which would go back to where I lived in Ireland. And, and I remember once when I was at college and there was a, an actor came in to uh, read some of the students' poems and she called me up to see her and she said, uh, I don't think I can read these. And uh, I said, why not? And she said, um, well, you write in an Irish accent and I can't do it. And I remember being completely surprised by that, but she was right. It's, it's the voice that you hear in your head, the spoken voice, which, which, which comes, gives you the rhythms and the cadences that you work with. Me and Benji, my teddy bear, went to bed to sleep. What else would we do but sleep? We couldn't, however. The noise was atrocious, shouting and laughing, thumping and whooping. Just imagine if that was us, I whispered in Benji's ear, guzzling wine and beer, making one hell of a fuss. What are we going to do? I looked into Benji's eyes, Benji's brown glass eyes. Benji, it has to be you, I said throwing him out and sliding out myself, knocking a book from a shelf with a thump and a shout from downstairs, go to sleep. The cheek of it, I thought. One of their party ought to investigate sleep possibilities up here, to lie down in our bed, pull the pillow over her head and ignore down there. Come on, Benji, let's go. We crept down the stairs, me and that Benji bear, and walked on tiptoe to the living room din that vibrated the floor. I pulled open the door and chucked Benji in. Robert Frost, who I think I've learned a lot from, he said one time there's two kinds of language. There's a language we use in speech and the language of books, and as far as I'm concerned, I could do without the last one altogether. And he says that, um, the language of poetry should not be that kind of language that people exclaim poetry at. And, and, and he said poetry should be a fresh look and a fresh listen. You should have seen him. He stood in the park and whistled underneath an oak tree. And all the dogs came bounding up and sat around him, keeping their big eyes on him, tails going like pendulums. And there was one cocker pup who went and licked his hand, and a Labrador who whimpered till the rest joined in. Then he whistled a second time, high-pitched as a stoat, over all the shouted dog names and whistles of owners, till a flurry of paws brought more dogs panting, as if they'd come miles. And these two found space on the flattened grass to stare at the boy's unmemorable face which all the dogs found special. Poetry is the only thing that's, that's, that's absolutely and utterly my creation. 
It's like, it's like a part of me almost. It's, it's a part of my senses now. I think it's part of anybody's senses, you know, because all you're doing is explaining what you're about, but it's an extension of my mind, you know, and my thoughts. And the, the reason that I write is because I have to value that. This, this poem is about um, proving yourself to your parents. You say I'm a lying child. I, I say I'm not. You say, there you go again. You say I'm a rebellious child. I said, no, I'm not. You say, there you go again. Quite frankly, Mum, I've never seen a rebellious child before. <laughs> and when my mate said, race you through the park, you know, the muddy one, I, I didn't think about the mud. When you said, why are you dirty? I, I could hear the anger in your voice. I said, I, I raced my mate through the park. You said it was deliberate. I said, I, I didn't. I mean, I did, but it wasn't. You said I was lying. I said, no, I'm not. You said, there you go again. Later, in, in the dawn of adolescence, it was time for my leave. I with my suitcase and social worker, you with your husband, walked our sliced ways. Sometimes I'd run back to you like a child through a muddy park with adult achievements tucked under my arm. Then I'd explain them with a childlike twinkle in my eye, thinking any mother would be proud. But your eyes, desperately trying to be wise and unrevealing, <laughs> Revealed all. Still, you fell back into the heart of the same rocking chair, saying, There you go again. And I did go, Mum. And I have gone. I'm from the northwest of England, and um, to me, my accent is my strength. What, what I have got, or what I am, is my, my biggest asset, and anybody's biggest asset. And I think in poetry, that's it. In poetry, your words are weighted. And when you read them, you want everybody to listen to them. Every single one. This poem is about um, when you hate somebody. Trying to imagine somebody above your head, right at this very moment in time, who you hate. Are they there? Yeah? Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, yeah. Right, OK, right. So you, you send, them, you send them this poem, or you, you say this poem to them. You're as popular as a posted birthday gift to somebody who just died! <laughs> I once said you wasn't that bad. I lied. <laughs> You're a conversation number. Your breath sticks lips together. <laughs> Why is it when your name is mentioned, there's a sudden change of weather? <laughs> You're a lift to a claustrophobic, a wit to a priest. You're gushy and gooey. You're my release. I wouldn't be a bell ringer with a face like that. Here, see how hard you can headbutt this cricket bat. How can we discuss the meaning of life when you don't deserve it? <laughs> It's a bad habit, that breathing. I wish you could get it. <laughs> it's short and sweet, and there isn't much pain. Have you ever tried hang gliding without a plane? <laughs> I write in, in the language that I was brought up in. And I, it would be risky to write in any other way. I'd like to do it, you know, just for a laugh, maybe, but I write in my own voice in the voice that I was brought up with. 